Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm just going to give it another minute. Uh, hopefully, though, everyone waiting um, will be joining us. And hopefully, everyone can see the slides as well. Excellent. Thanks for the thumbs up. <laughs> That's brilliant. All right. Thank you very much for joining uh, Pam Wellness this morning for our webinar about um, elevating work culture, promoting menopause awareness and support at work. My name is Kate Martin. I'm Head of Psychological Services here at Pam Wellbeing. Um, and I have my colleague Nina Parson with me today, who's Director of Psychology for our Neurodiversity uh, Department. Good morning. Hello. Nice to meet you all. Nice to see you all. Thanks, Nina. And um, we are uh, going to talk about, obviously, talk about menopause uh, today. Uh, we've got World Menopause Day tomorrow, and we're going to be talking a little bit about um, what is the menopause. I know a lot of you will have this information already and be aware of it, but I'll, you know, be doing that overview. Um, we'll talk a bit about how. Uh, menopause impacts at work and um, we're going to be looking also and Nina will be um, talking us through um, menopause and neurodiversity um, and how, how that can have an impact in work as well and um, so we'll be looking at that and then we'll, we'll finish off looking a little bit about what workplaces can do to support menopausal colleagues. There are some interesting statistics, and I'm sure many of you will be familiar uh, with these already. As we know, women make up approximately half the population um, in the world. Um, and all women will go through menopause. Um, I will talk about women, but I'm also just going to mention the fact that, you know, this can, menopause can impact trans men, uh, non-binary um, and intersex people as well and so you know it is broader than um, those who are identifying as women about one percent of women um, enter menopause before the age of 40 and 0.1 percent under the age of 30 and whilst that's a small percentage then it does have significant impact particularly when something like that's happening at an earlier age um, the average age of menopause in the UK is 51. Um, and there are, however, there are ethnic variations. Um, and with anything like an average, it is an average. So there are people who are going through menopause at an earlier age, and there are people who will be going through menopause at an older age as well. Most women enter menopause naturally. Uh, for others, menopause will be induced through surgery, such as removal of ovaries or medical treatment. Uh, which impacts the functioning of ovaries. Um, what we need to do is just think about a little bit about what is happening in a woman's body during menopause. So, as we as we know, you know, in a woman's adult life, then there are distinct phases. So we have the reproductive years when estrogen and progesterone hormones are stable for most women across their monthly cycle. Then. Um, an individual will enter the perimenopause uh, age or stage, sorry. Um, this is where we start to see estrogen and progesterone hormones fluctuating. And it's these fluctuations in the hormones that cause the menopause symptoms for many women. Perimenopause can last from a few months. Um, to up to eight years. Uh, and, of, and for most women, it's off the perimenopause phase is roughly around four to eight years in length. Um, and it's difficult to predict how long that's going to be for each individual. Postmenopause is that time when at 12 months after the last menstruation. So 12 months when there has been no menstruation, 
is the point of menopause and then a woman moves into that post-menopause stage. And what we find is that the estrogen and progesterone levels have dropped significantly and they start to stabilise at much lower levels. Um, it can take a few years post-menopause and so for some women they do continue to experience symptoms into their post-menopause years, but many women uh, report experiencing you know, a reduction in the symptoms that they have been experiencing during perimenopause. What we do know is that there are particular symptoms that can be prevalent at different stages uh, through this uh, transition. Um, so 80 to 90 percent of women will experience some symptoms in a way, uh, which means that there's a percentage of women um, who don't really notice going through menopause at all. 25% of women will experience debilitating symptoms. So symptoms that are having a absolutely significant impact on their day-to-day -day functioning, their family life, their relationships, their work, and their social life. Other people will find that they're experiencing symptoms, but they find ways of managing them and they're not having that debilitating impact in the same way. And that's why it's really important to recognize that each person who's going through the menopause it is a unique journey to them. Whilst there are crossovers and there are there can be similar experiences, each person will have their own unique journey throughout that transition period. Some of the common symptoms during perimenopause phase can be irregular periods, um, or some people will experience heavier periods, uh, but that the, the regularity of the cycle will start to shift. Others will experience disturbed sleep and insomnia, low energy levels, low mood, anxiety, low libido and low sexual drive for some people, impaired memory and concentration, a sense of brain fog, and this can have obviously an impact for um, work as well. Uh, joint aches, headaches, palpitations, vaginal dryness and urinary symptoms. Other things that are common, uh, particularly during the perimenopause phase, are night sweats. So some women will also start to experience hot flushes uh, during perimenopause, but for others it will be much more night sweats, and it may be that um, they don't experience hot flushes until they are closer to that, that actually completing that menopause journey as well. So it does very much vary um, for each person doing it. As I've already mentioned, menopause is that point of no period for 12 months. For most people, um, then, as I've said, their menopause symptoms start to recede and their quality of life will improve if they're someone who's been having uh, debilitating symptoms as well. However, there is uh, some people whose symptoms do continue post-menopause as well. And then there's that post-menopause phase, which is the rest of a person's life. Um, so, you know, recognising that that has been that transition. So we, we can think a little bit about um, menopause as a bit like um, the reversal of puberty. So when we go th through puberty, that's our transition into adult life, into a reproductive years. Um, and menopause is the transition out of the reproductive years. And then, you know, all being well, we've uh, got many healthy years ahead of us. However, it is known that um, post-menopause, that for um, many women, there can be an increased risk of osteoporosis due to loss of bone density, increased risk of heart disease and dementia as well. Um, I know that there's, there's limited research in relation to women's health at the moment and that there's lots of research that has been started recently. So, I would imagine we, we will be learning a lot more about how these things are impacting in the coming years. Some of the common symptoms uh, that have an impact in terms of the workplace, and this is always, as I say, you know, to varying intensity, but uh, British Menopause Society, in one of their surveys, identified that 70 to, to, 70 to 80 percent of women will experience hot flushes and night sweats. Three quarters of women have menopause symptoms relating to brain function. 
And this does include the vasomoto symptoms, which are the hot flushes and the, and the night sweat, uh, because the body's thermostat resides in our brain. There's also then the psychological symptoms, such as impaired memory and concentration, mental fatigue, sense of overwhelm, forgetfulness, being easily distracted, anxiety, panic attacks, loss of confidence, low mood and depression. And these can all have, you know, a really significant impact in someone's life, both within their working environment and within their uh, personal life as well. 20% of women experience mood swings and depression. Um, and of that 20%, half experience suicidal ideation. And this is something that we need to be really aware of because um, statistics for England and Wales for suicide rates indicate that for women, um, the highest completion for suicide uh, is during the menopause years. And so there's, there's going to be a connection in terms of those hormonal changes, how those hormones are impacting on someone and um, some of the ways that uh, that's having. So we need to be really aware of that in terms of, you know, if we've got colleagues who are struggling with um, depression, with suicidal ideation, about signposting them to support, to um, get assistance with that, to speak to their GPs as well, because um, this type of depression, what's known because it's hormonally based, is very different to other types of depression as well. A third of perimenopause women report struggling to fall asleep and to stay asleep. And we know that poor quality sleep over a series of nights will impair our daytime functioning as well. That can have an impact in both workplace and in personal life as well. Um, there can be, there is some indication, but as I mentioned, there needs to be more research in terms of women who've experienced depression or anxiety earlier in life. Um, there can be a correlation to some experience during the menopause years, but that isn't always going to be the case. So it does vary. The other one, one to be aware of is that stress is a huge trigger for many women. And because of the hormonal changes, our tolerance for managing stressful situation changes and things that where we would normally have been able to manage them in the past suddenly become harder to manage. And this is because our ability to regulate the stress response and the, our cortisol and adrenal levels are reduced during, due to the drop in estrogen levels. So this is then triggering the fight, flight, freeze response. What we also know is that 45% of women report that their symptoms are negatively impacting on work. Um, and so it is really important that in workplaces that we look at that um, and we look at how we can support people, um, you know, particularly with things like uh, we're having less able to, less ability to concentrate and that increased stress. Um, and also for those who are moving into their latter years, so I, in terms of their career, so the 51 to 60 age group feeling less physically abled as well. Because obviously everyone's doing different types of jobs and that has to be taken into consideration. So we've talked about that impact in terms of workplace. What I'm going to do is hand over to Nina, who's going to talk a little bit about uh, neurodiversity and menopause. And then we will uh, come back and uh, talk a little bit about how workplaces can support people as well during the menopause. Thank you so much, Kate. So um, today um, I'm going to focus mostly on the impact of perimenopause on the neurodevelopmental conditions of autism and ADHD. Um, we don't have time to go into lots of detail about these conditions today, but there's been some research into these particular conditions um, as a whole. And um, what we have found is that, that the clinical research behind uh, the impact of the perimenopause and menopause on neurodivergent women or people that don't identify as, as being female but still go through the menopause 
um, they um, those scientific studies have tended to be quite small numbers. So there have there have been lots of surveys where they've had hundreds of respondents, but in terms of actually being sort of science led, evidence based, um, there's been less kind of uh, there's less of a plethora of of um, research studies out there at the moment. As, and as Kate said, you know, I think we'll all see more of that going forward in, in the coming years. Um, but I think the key thing is that um, just like neurotypical women, um, some may go through transition with very mild symptoms. Um, but what we have seen from the research that so far, that there are some common themes emerging uh, regarding the impact. So next slide, please, Kate. So um, thinking um, about uh, people who are autistic, um, and autism and the perimenopause, what we have seen or what the research has suggested that um, it's often the intensity with which uh, the um, feelings uh, that are being experienced can be heightened during um, uh, the menopause, perimenopause for autistic people and with those with ADHD. For example, sensory sensitivities is an area which can be impacted uh, hugely, um, although it's not a symptom um, as listed in the perimenopause symptoms on the NHS website, but for autistic individuals, menopause can really intensify those sensory sensitivities. And by that, I mean, um, it could be something uh, that they've had all their life. Um, and it's a long standing challenge. It could be to do with particular smells. It could be touch of particular materials. Um, and it's just there, but during the perimenopause, that can often be heightened, and the threshold for actually being being able to cope with those sensitivities often is lowered. And also self awareness, being aware of what those mood changes are all about, um, and that, that those symptoms could actually be due to perimenopause. And often, you know, we see a lot of masking um, in the neurodivergent community, and you've got people who've, you know coped through life, you know, recognising they've had challenges, but often found ways to try and mitigate and manage them. So they might just be pushing uh, to the back of their minds, you know, and just continue coping as they've always done. Um, and that can mean that, you know, people are not always kind of putting two and two together and recognising that perhaps there's a reason why you, that this intensity and why you're feeling the way that you currently are. And, you know, it's only in hindsight that often people can draw, join those dots going backwards. Um, and the emotional regulation piece, again, that can increase um, during menopause and also just and as Kate mentioned about, you know, challenges of planning and organising brain fog. These are all to do with the executive functioning parts of the brain. And again, we know from um, uh, in the neurodiverse community that these are often areas which already are challenging. And again, everything around perimenopause and, and hormonal changes are causing executive functioning to perhaps not be at its best. Um, so the challenge of memory might become even more heightened or more regular than perhaps they were previously. Um, and also, I think there's an unpredictability of not going through the perimenopause. You know, you don't know when you're going to have those hot flushes. You, you know, the irregularity of periods, um, it's all unpredictable and, you know, how you're feeling each day can change. And for people who are autistic, for autistic individuals, it's, um, you know, who like structure, who like the predictability, that can be quite challenging and it can be a struggle for, for some. And um, also it's around, you know, communication. Um, and it, we know that lots of um, people have um, challenges with social communication. Um, and that behind them, you know, it could be that they then have struggled to perhaps communicate to other people, such as their GP or a line manager at work, what they're going through um, and being able to sort of have the vocabulary or to really understand what, what you know, what is happening. Um, and, you know, the other thing is to remember that we're talking about uh, the sandwich generation, um, which effectively, you know, a lot of women are carers uh, to aging parents, they have the work demands, and there's the fight, health, financial health, relationships, children, leaving already a little time for self-care or even self-reflection to really take on board what's happening and recognising that actually this could all be linked to perimenopause. Um, and then, you know, it's, you know, ensuring that, you know, recognising that and then being able to seek support 
um, again, that can be challenging in terms of knowing who to, who they thought that you know you can trust, who you can talk to, and be open about how you're thinking and feeling at that precise moment. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please, Kate. So um, Attitude did a survey, Attitude magazine did a survey, and they found that 94% of respondents said that their ADHD was more severe during perimenopause and menopause. Um, and we can relate that back scientifically to the decline in oestrogen. And we already know that people who have ADHD, you know, they they um, struggle with the uptake of dopamine and declining oestrogen levels actually impacts that dopamine level even further. So where it's already low in someone who's got ADHD, it's even lower once they start going through the perimenopause with those hormonal fluctuations. And again, you know, the executive functioning, the planning and organising, the concentration, the focus, all areas which are identified as traits with ADHD, with the falling oestrogen levels, this can exacerbate um, these areas of challenge. And of course, you know, we know um, that neurotypical individuals have these challenges as well. But I think the thing is with a people who've got ADHD is that it tends to be um, more heightened and more frequent um, in, in their in, in experiencing those challenges. Um, and also, I think, you know, the fluctuating hormone levels can impact day to day life. Um, you know, previously, you know, a menstruating woman was able to work well in their job. And now all of a sudden, you know, things are becoming more challenging just generally. Um, and one thing that we um, some research has indicated is that often, you know, as we know, neurodiverse conditions do co-occur and they co-occur with mental health challenges as well. Um, but what we found is that um, there can be someone who's been diagnosed as autistic, but it's only as they're going through the perimenopause that they actually recognise that they've actually got ADHD traits as well, or someone who's masked very well throughout their life. And it's only at the perimenopause stage where things start to really get um, challenging um, and all of a sudden a number of traits starts coming to the, to the forefront, which are autistic traits that perhaps they've done well masking and being able to put coping strategies in place throughout their life. And now it starts to kind of fall away um, and, and it's also uncontrollable. Um, and that's often that can be a very challenging time um, for individuals who are going through that, who are autistic. Um, and trying to kind of make sense of all of that as well, or perhaps they don't know they're autistic and just trying to try and make sense of what the hell is going on here. Um, and often, you know, it's building that awareness piece up front so that people kind of know what to expect um, around perimenopause. If we can move on to the next stage slide, please. Kate. So I think the key thing there is about self-discovery. Um, and if you're, you know, Sometimes, as I mentioned, individuals only come to recognise that they have underlying neurodevelopmental conditions during the perimenopause phase. And it's interesting because our own data here at PAM has identified that twice as many women are referred to us for neurodiversity screening or diagnosis than men in that age bracket of 40 to 59 years of age. Um, and that's obviously in line with a trend of a late diagnosis around the perimenopause for many women who, again, you know, there's trends in that data that's come out from a number of researchers as well. Um, and, of, and we also found that from Attitude magazine, um, it, they, it, their findings found that um, reported that most of the women received a diagnosis for ADHD around the age of 43. So um, that's quite a long chunk of life that you've lived without recognising what those traits were related to ADHD. Um, and that was only secondary to being diagnosed with anxiety and depression in that survey that they did. Um, so I think, you know, there's lots of things to consider there in terms of considering, you know, what those challenges are and how they, um, how they um, manifest, you know, whether it's insomnia, whether it's sort of discomfort with social situations, you know, we've very much kind of learned to get on with it through life. Um, and that it's just the recognition that maybe things are changing and there's a reason behind it um, and that, you're, you know, you're not going, you know, crazy or anything. You know, there are reasonings behind this, these changes that you're feeling inside your body or in your experiences of day to day life. Um, 
And we know that, um, you know, the perimenopausal stage, you know, it, but when um, it starts to be recognised, then um, obviously that can lead to better understanding of the challenges um, and why they might be happening. So um, just go on to my next slide, please, Kate. So um, what support strategies can, can there be, can be put in place to support neurodivergent individuals? Well, I think the key thing is, you know, bringing awareness and, you know, having the knowledge of what those symptoms of perimenopause can look like. I think we all know about the hot flushes, but it's not always obvious some of the other ones um, that, you know, that we've talked about today. And, and it could be, you know, um, insomnia. It could be heavier menstruation, which I don't think is really talked about very much. Um, and also, um, you know, the co-occurrence with other challenges that, that can arise as well, such as mental health. Um, you can get symptom check checklists online, which are quite helpful to keep a record um, of, you know, what you're experiencing. And often that can be also quite good to, uh, if you need to go and speak to a GP, you know, you can show that to them and then you're relying less on having to kind of in the moment try and explain how you're thinking or feeling at the time or what's been going on. Um, and also, you know, it's building support networks. It's attending events like this. It's, you know, and for some people who are neurodiverse, they may prefer not to, you know, do um, maybe so much social interaction, but they may find comfort in an online community uh, where they can share and, and listen to others' stories and experiences. And um, also it's about, you know, what can you do at work to support and you know requesting adaptions. We do workplace needs assessments here where we can recommend a, a accommodations for employees to their employers um, and also ways of coping day to day with, um, you know, the challenges that they're facing. Um, and I think lastly, it's really about self-compassion and remembering to take time and recognising that, you know, there needs to be some self-care as well as we run around doing many different things, we're wearing many different hats. It's really important, you know, to take some downtime. Um, looking after yourself, eating well, regular exercise, meditation, sleeping, trying to sleep well. All of these are really important. And for some, obviously, they may choose to take um medication as an option as well um, but that's not right for everyone and obviously it's a personal choice but I think the really key thing here is to remember that whatever those challenges are at the moment it's a transition phase and and you will pass through that so I'm going to hand you back to Kate now. There, I was starting to talk. I forgot I'd muted myself. So thank you very much, Nina. Absolutely fascinating. Um, a lot of that can be um, applied not just with um, neurodiverse colleagues, but also with neurotypical colleagues as well. And especially in terms of that last slide you were talking about, Nina, in terms of strategies and self-support strategies and self-compassion during uh, this type of transition as well. Um, it's often something that we we can be we're often compassionate to other people um, and we frequently forget to do it with ourselves as well so it's an important reminder on that one um what we moving back to talking um overall in relation to menopause we know that one in four women so a quarter of women in work consider leaving their jobs due to menopause symptoms and this is a this is a high percentage I mean that I mean that that percentage of women don't leave their jobs, but it is just something that a quarter of women going through menopause do consider it. So I think that's really important to take on board. This can relate to loss of confidence as an outcome of symptoms impacting on cognitive functioning, self-consciousness about extreme hot flushes and sweating, multiple stresses at work and life, um, work and home. Um, as Nina has mentioned about, you know, Sandwich generation being in the middle, midlife, there is often increased caring responsibilities with children, depending on their age. Some may still be quite young, others teenagers, others young adults. Uh, with aging parents, there can be pressures in relationships and relationship breakdowns, um, and this can be reflected in uh, divorce rates um, and other separations. Uh, we've also got the consideration of children leaving home, so empty nest syndrome, as, it, as some people experience. Others may be making career changes um, and more and more workplaces um, are seeing those, seeing those changes. And with 
you know, are the current generation of women being in a very different place to previous generation of women in terms of work, then it's really important that more and more workplaces look at how they can support colleagues going through the menopause to support them remaining in work. Because, you know, for those of you who are in HR, you will know the significant costs associated with, um, you know, having to uh, recruit, replace and train a new member of staff to their full productivity. What can workplaces do? How can workplaces support colleagues on their menopause journey? One, one of the things to look at is uh, about having a menopause action plan. This is something that um, in terms of Labour's manifesto promise was that they, as part of their make work pay promise within their manifesto, is a plan that for all employers with 250 plus employees to develop a menopause action plan about how they as an employer will support people going through their menopause journey within the workplace. And this is a really important consideration because um, the CIPD survey from 2023 identified that the top three things that menopausal women um, identified as influencing their sense of support at workplace are that perception of having a healthy workplace culture, colleagues of a similar age who are also experiencing symptoms, and raising awareness through training and also having access to counselling uh, as part of support. So a lot of organisations have started to introduce a menopause policy, not just having that action plan, but also to have a menopause policy. And that's always going to be led by your HR, your people team in terms of that and looking at you know what's appropriate within your workplace because depending what industry you're working in depends on what those working conditions are going to be like the working environment in terms of being able to connect with others who is who are going through uh, the menopause as well then a lot of organizations are finding that having things like a menopause network or a menopause cafe um, is a really great way of allowing colleagues to connect to have that experiential shared support it can be educative and relationship building reduces a sense of isolation for many people. What's interesting, and this is comes from those where have they've put this in place, is that actually it's recommended that these aren't exclusive to women going through the menopause, but actually that is open to anyone who's interested because that's the only way of increasing understanding and awareness, uh, particularly with those who are younger, uh, with um, with men, uh, is about making this about a shared experience as well. Flexible working might be something that some workplaces are able to support with and it's reasonably common for, for women. One of the ways that um, many women uh, ask their employer to support them to remain in work is to look at reducing their hours or flexible start and finish time or looking at where they're working etc. Now obviously this is all going to be based on what is operationally feasible for any working environment. And that's a you know, really important thing to think about in terms of what your workplace is like. What I can add is that CIPD survey identified that 67% of uh, respondents said that hybrid working was making their menopause transition easier. But that's not realistic for all workplaces because it depends on what um, industry you are operating in. For those who are experiencing really um, intense symptoms, debilitating symptoms, then an OH referral uh, can be useful for, for both the employee and the employer in terms of being able to gain guidance about what might what is happening for them, uh, any recommended reasonable adjustments that um, are not covered within the menopause policy if an organisation has that in place. And so reasonable adjustments are all going to be very much about what is appropriate for the environment. Again, CIPD survey identified 43% of women reporting that this type of support being a beneficial. This could relate to adjustments to duties and tasks and responsibilities. Could also, if, if you're in an industry where you wear a uniform, looking at the type of uniform, um, having lighter uniforms, increased breaks, more frequent manager check-ins, etc. There's a lot of different things that can be considered there. Other things that have already been mentioned here um, is about having a menopause awareness training. Now, this increases knowledge and understanding for all managers and colleagues, whatever their age. 
so that they can be more sensitive and considerate to colleagues during their menopause journey. It increases awareness for women approaching perimenopause because a lot of what people might be hearing about um, can probably be quite scary and intimidating. So it's important to think that actually this is a transition. You don't know what your experience is going to be until you're starting to go through it. And there is life on the other side of it as well. However, the more we know, the more informed we are, the more in control we can be of the things we can control, the more we can influence other stuff, and the more we've got an opportunity to accept the things that are outside of our control as well. Um, it can also help us in terms of if we are having conversations with our GPs. Some people are fortunate that they have access to GPs who've um, had additional training and it, um, around menopause and are really, really receptive and responsive to that. Um, but unfortunately, we still hear far too many stories about women who um, go to their GP and get really lacking support. Um, it's really disappointing that that's still happening. Um, I'm hopeful that, you know, as, as years progress, we will see that dramatically change. But that is still something happening at the moment. Um, we do offer a range of um, menopause awareness training, some suitable for all colleagues, some specifically for manage, managers, some looking at psychological and emotional symptoms. It can also be useful to, for managers to get um, support and further training with how to have supportive conversation, uh, because that's something that is really useful. Um, and it can increase that confidence for a manager approaching a conversation with something with someone that they they may need a little bit more courage about so how to have those courageous conversations in a supportive manner um we obviously also offer access to psychological support for people who who need that support nina's talked about neurodiversity um, and the support that's available for neurodiverse colleagues um, and the other area to look at for organizations particularly larger ones is what toolkits you have in place uh, for managers and colleagues as well in relation to menopause. So those are all the bits that we've got to talk about today. Um, I know that there's been lots of things going on in uh, the chat, so it's it's great to hear about all of you know that that feedback. It's you know it's sad to hear about some of the um, challenges that people still face as well we do have a few minutes left so we'll have a quick look at some of the questions that uh we will um that have been posed um i know that there were some questions around um access to the video that will be posted on our um youtube channel um afterwards um we don't share slides in relation to our our trainings but the the video will be available on on our youtube channel there I think, Nina, there was some questions in relation I saw popping up earlier um, about um, neurodiversity, particularly. Um, so I'm not sure if you've had a chance to look at those at all. Yeah, I saw that there was one around suicidal ideation and autism, or I think it was autism or ADHD, I can't remember now, but um, there have been studies that have indicated that autistic adults are nine times higher um, than the general population uh, to have suicidal ideation and and I and although I, I'm not aware of a specific study looking at perimenopause and suicidal ideation it has come out in some studies through thematic analysis of the data because sometimes they've just been they've been like qualitative interviews with women go, talking about their experiences and, and and those who are autistic who are having um and talking about their experiences and, and a number of them have talked about you know suicidal ideation as part of that but as i said i think there's it's a growing area of interest in terms of the research um and there have been some studies but i don't th I, i'm not aware of one that specifically looked at suicidal ideation and autism through the at the perimenopause stage itself uh, if anyone knows and wants to point me in that direction i'll be very happy to read that article um that, but there are plenty um that have focused on suicide ideation and autism more gener gener generally in the population and as I said, one one report has found that it's nine times higher than the general population. Yeah. 
but there's lots of things and i think we're, we're gonna there's gonna be so much information coming out in the next few years because there has just been such a lack of study and research not just in relation to uh menopause but in relation to men uh women's health overall so for all uh age groups for for women and um, i think it's really important that if people are struggling that you know th there's knowing where to go to look for support so um, if you're with a large employer who has access to an employee assistance program, then uh, calling them, uh, you know, having contact with your GP. If you're not getting the support you're looking for from a GP, ask to speak to another GP. We're all entitled to get a second opinion. We don't need to accept the first one that we have in relation to it. Um, and it can be really challenging, but it's, it's also being able to, you know, feel that we can talk to someone at work as well. Um, particularly if we're really struggling with work. So that, that's a really important thing um, to be able to do. But yeah, it, it can be a minefield to navigate. But do you know that, you know, if you start reaching out to different people that there is support out there for people as well. I think, Nina, there was a question about how do people access neurodiversity services? Um well, you can go if you're one of our clients at Pam Group. Um, if you want to go through, uh, you can go through referral um, through our website uh, to find out the contact details. Um, or if you're with DWP, I know that they have a an, an internal team that you can go to to um, refer through to um, get our support services. Excellent. Okay. Um, I'm just trying anyone, to navigate through some of the wants, chat stuff yeah. to see if there are any other questions at the moment. We've got a couple of minutes left before uh, we will be um, signing off. Um, yeah, and if, so any, if when, anyone wants to, um, yes, talk to, I mean, send a message personally to myself or Kate, then please feel free to do that as well. And we're both on LinkedIn, aren't we, Kate? Yes, we are. Absolutely. We can be found on LinkedIn. <laughs> Okay, so, uh, okay. Um, yeah, thank you. I'm glad to hear that everyone's been finding it a, a really useful and insightful session. I know that, you know, there's there's lots of these going on, on this week um, from various different providers. Um, and it's essential that we continue having this conversation uh, because one, we need to raise everyone's awareness and equally, we'll be learning more. And so there'll be more things that we will have to, to share in the coming years as well. So I'm really pleased that you were all able to uh, make the time to join Nina and I this morning to just get a little overview and insight into menopause in the workplace and uh, what we need to be looking at in relation to workplaces, supporting people going through the, their menopause journey. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.